Hallelujah. 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 Good evening, church. Good evening, everyone. Watching me from wherever, all over the world. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, whatever the time is where you are. It's a time to celebrate God. It's a time to celebrate the move of God. It's a time to celebrate the providence of God. It's a time to celebrate the goodness of our God. And tonight we celebrate his goodness. And we are proud to say, Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good. Come on, say it where you are. Say, Lord, you are good. And your mercies endures forever. Come on, say it again. Say, Lord, you are good. And your mercies endures forever. So, Father, we worship you. We give you all the praise, Lord. Hallelujah. Wow, what a, what a beautiful start to, to the last quarter of this year. If God kept you up until now, he'll keep you right to the very end. I believe that very much. And he'll keep you for many more years to come in the name of Jesus. So wherever you are, just say, Lord, I thank you because my life is preserved. I thank you because this quarter will not be the end of my life. I thank you because I'm going to, I'm going to walk into the new year, even unless Jesus comes back before the end of the year. But if he doesn't, I will be walking into the new year in victory, in honor, in power. Father, thank you. Thank you because this last quarter of the year will be a year of exploits for me. This last quarter of the year will be a year of honor for me. A year, uh, this last quarter will be a, a quarter of favor and of the power of God moving in my life like never before. Father, we look up to you with expectation, knowing that the latter part of this year will be greater than the former part of this year. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. Hallelujah. And so in this last quarter as a church, we're going to be looking at what we have themed the power of resilience. The power of resilience. What a time in such, uh, 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 or what a moment in the history of the world today that we can be looking at what it means to be resilient. Amen. What, 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 a, what, a, what, a, what a good timing in the, in the face of this so-called pandemic that's just raving its head all over the place. There is the power of resilience that we need to have as God's children to know that we are preserved in this time, that we are safe in this time. And not only that, there are also other things and other areas where we need to, 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 to exercise the power of resilience. Even, even if there was no pandemic, we still need to continue to exercise the power of resilience because we have an enemy who is after your, uh, uh, who, who, who is just after your destruction. We have an enemy who wants to make sure that he ruins your testimony. We have an enemy who wants to make sure that it does not go well with you. But through the power of resilience, we can always overcome. Amen. And so, in, in, in looking at, uh, at the power of resilience in this quarter, we're going to be discussing and looking at things like what the enemy does, how the tactics that the enemy uses, how he seeks to distract, to manipulate, to deceive, and to attack. We're going to be looking at those things. We're going to be looking at how to stay strong in Christ despite the odds that we face on a daily basis. We're going to be looking at how the power of resilience can bring you peace and joy in Christ. We're going to be looking at how to stay resilient in moving forward in Christ. Paul said, one thing I do, I forget the things that are behind and I press forward. I press on towards the mark of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not because there are no adversaries, but because in understanding that I have a God who is greater than my adversaries. And I know that I can press forward in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that's the name that's above every other name. And at that name, every knee must bow. In heaven, on the earth, and beneath the earth. That covers it all. Hallelujah. So there's no way that name is pronounced that whatever it is that is living or existing does not bow to. The stars bow to that name. The planets bow to that name. The whole of the universe answer to that name. Entities answer to that name. Spirits answer to that name. Hallelujah. So we've been given that name to stay strong and be resilient in our pursuit of God, in our pursuit of our destinies, in our pursuits of the future that God has for us. Hallelujah. So we're going to be looking at how to maintain our stand and our conviction in Christ and achieve those results that we desire through Christ as we continually deal with the schemes of the enemy. So tonight what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be laying a foundation. I'm going to be laying a foundation. I'm going to be building upon that foundation as the weeks go by, block by block, uh, uh, um, 
um, yeah, block by block, isn't it? When you want to build a house, you, you mold blocks, don't you? <laughs> Praise the Lord. So we're going to be building upon it block by block, you know, bringing, uh, bringing out some revelation and insights. And I believe that through this teaching in this quarter, you're going to be ready for 2021. Hallelujah. You're going to be ready in power. You're going to be ready in confidence. So what does it mean to be resilient in the context of Christianity, in the context of, of, of you walking by faith as a child of God? It means to remain the same in conviction. It means to remain the same in conviction, to remain the same in faith, to remain the same in trust, to remain the same in value, no matter the kind of pressure or challenge that you go through. Hallelujah. There's no challenge or pressure that you go through that should be big enough to move you from your place of conviction in Christ, from your place of faith and trust in Christ, from your place of value that you have in Christ and for Christ. No matter the pressure, no matter the challenge, you must remain resilient in your faith. You must remain steady. You must remain convinced that God is on your side. Hallelujah. And when, when I read through scriptures, I read the likes of people like Paul, who were resilient, who was resilient, even through the adversities that he faced. I mean, Paul would describe the things that he, he had to face. He would describe the untold hardship that he had to face. He says, but none of these things move me. He says, woe is me if I preach not the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul said his face like a flint. He said, I'm not only ready to suffer pain or, pre or be under pressure, I'm also ready to die for this gospel. So Paul threw everything out there. He, 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 he left it all. He said, I count all things that I ever have, I count it dung that I may gain Christ. He said that I may know him and the, and, and, the, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. So Paul was resilient in his faith. Paul was resilient in his convictions. Paul was resilient in his trust. Paul was resilient in the value that he had for Christianity. No pressure took him up. In fact, the challenges that he faced propelled him the more. It made him thicker and more resilient in his pursuit after the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. And we see the likes of people like Abraham, our father of faith. And I read from Romans chapter 4 from verse 16. It says, therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace, to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Verse 18, who against hope believed in hope. Can, can, you, can you believe that? That Abraham against hope believed in hope. Have you ever walked or been in a situation where you were walking against hope? Where you were walking in a, in a, in a, in a way that you looked in front of you, it was hopeless. You looked behind you, hopeless. You looked around you, hopeless. It looked like you were in a hopeless situation. Abraham still had hope in a hopeless situation. He said, against hope, he believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So Abraham settled on that which was spoken. He settled on the voice of God. He settled on what God said to him. And he said, look, even though my natural circumstance may not look like it, but what God has spoken sure does look like it. Hallelujah. And I'm going to settle on what God has said. So we have a choice daily to either settle on what God has said to us or settle on what our convictions are about Christ and in, about the word of God or settle for the circumstances that are around us. Hallelujah. But Abraham chose the better. And I believe in this quarter you're going to be choosing the better. In the name of Jesus. To settle on the spoken word. To settle on the written word. To settle on that which God has declared that is your future. Hallelujah. The Bible says, who against hope 
believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So his hope was not just, oh, I want to be strong, but he had hope in that which was spoken. Hallelujah. Tonight I want to encourage you to begin to have hope in that which has already been spoken. That which is declared. That which has been prophetically declared. That which has been written in God's word. Begin to have hope in that. That's how Abraham was able to navigate through the challenges that he had to go through. He says, so shall thy seed be. And verse 19 says, and being not weak in faith, he considered not. I tell you something, there are things that you need to begin to consider not. Hallelujah. That you've got a very uh, 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 lower salary than what you expect of God, you need, to con you need to start not to consider what you earn. And begin to consider the bigness of the one who can make it all happen. Hallelujah. Because when his favor rests upon you, it's not about what you earn or what you, do not, what you do not earn. It's about what's coming to you. Hallelujah. It's about what's coming to you. It's about what's been released from the heavenlies coming your way. It's about the divine positioning that will lead to your elevation. So it's not about what you're earning. It's not about what's coming in. It's about what's, what's coming or what God has set you up for. Hallelujah. So Abraham considered not. So there are certain things you need to begin to look at in your life that do not really tally with what you believe God is saying to you and begin to consider them not. Even though they may look so real, but consider them not. Was Abraham old? Yes. Was his body really dead in the physical? Yes, it was. But the Bible says he considered not. Hallelujah. He considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. So he had two things he had to not consider in order for that which was spoken to come to pass in his life. Verse 20 says, he staggered not at that promise of God through unbelief. So he wasn't like, like a yo-yo, up today, down tomorrow. You know, oh, I believe today, no, because of the pressures and the way it looks so hopeless. I do not believe again. No, the Bible says he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Amen. I see you giving glory to God all through this quarter. In the name of Jesus, I see you standing strong in faith like Father Abraham, giving glory to God over that which has been spoken into your life, over that which God has released over your life, over that which you believe will be your portion by the end of this quarter, I see you giving glory to God. Abraham was strong in faith, was giving glory to God, not because the promise had come, but because he, was, he kept a heart of expectation. Hallelujah. And being fully persuaded, that's the key. He became what? Fully persuaded. What he had promised, he was also able to perform. He was fully persuaded that God cannot lie. God cannot fail. God cannot disappoint. You need to begin to have that mindset that God cannot lie, God will not fail, and God cannot disappoint you. Hallelujah. Not only can he not disappoint, that God was fully more than able to perform. You're not dealing with a God that's out of the ability to perform. He said in the book of Jeremiah, he said, I'm the Lord God Almighty. Just call, up, call on to me and I'll answer you. And I'll show you great and mighty things that you do not know about. In another place he says, I am the Lord God Almighty. Is anything too hard for me to do? When Sarah was laughing and said, how can that be? Shall I also now still have pleasure in my husband? When the angel that visited Abraham said, at this time of life, next year, you shall bear a child. And Sarah had not laugh. And then he said, Sarah laughed. And Sarah said, no, I didn't laugh. And, and, and the, the, the angel said, is there anything too hard for God to do? Hallelujah. I want to I wanna challenge you. There's nothing too hard for God. There's nothing too big for God. Just like that slogan that we've been hearing from Pastor Darius, when he says that what, uh, uh, what, uh, uh, what God cannot do does not exist, if I'm right. <laughs> when my wife is saying what God cannot do does not exist do you know that's a revelation for me the moment she began to say those along those lines it became a revelation for me that if if what God cannot do does not ex, does not exist in this side of the world neither does it exist in heaven hallelujah 
So God is more than able to perform. I need you to understand that. And Paul was encouraging us in 1 Corinthians 16, 13. He says, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, and be strong. If there's any time that God wants us to operate in the power of resilience, it is a time like this. When I look at the likes of people like Job, and I see all that Job went through, yet the Bible says he did not curse God. Yet he did not, he did not, he did not, you know, uh, uh, become rude. Or, or he did not think evil about his God. The Bible says he did not charge God foolishly, neither did Job sin. Even when his wife told him, do you still retain your in integrity? He said, she, she said to him, curse God and die. But he said unto her, you speak as one of the foolish women. Shall we receive good at the hand of the Lord? And shall we not receive evil? He says, in all these Job did not sin with his lips. Hallelujah. Job did not sin. These were men that were resilient. And we know how they, how they ended. We know that by the time they came out of what they had to go through, they came out seven times at least better than they went in. I see you coming out at least seven times better. By the end of this quarter, you're coming out more than seven times better than you're starting this quarter. In the name of Jesus. Because of the power of resilience, you are coming out seven times better and greater. In Jesus' name. If Job could do it under the old covenant, how much more you under the new covenant? If Abraham could do it under the, whole, under the old covenant, how much more you under the new covenant? Hallelujah. We have a better testimony. We have a better uh, 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 testament. Hallelujah. Upon better promises. When I also look at the life of Joseph under the old covenant, Joseph was a man that was sold into slavery. He was sold off by his brothers. Joseph demonstrated resilience in the fact that, number one, he was sold off by his brothers. So he went through what you call family betrayal. The brothers that were meant to cover him and, 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 and protect him, they betrayed him by selling him off. Number two, he was sold off as a slave in Egypt double tragedy. So those guys didn't just take him, they now sold him up as a slave. So he became what? A slave. And the statement that his brother said was, let us see what shall become of his dream. Do you have people hating on you because of your dreams? Do you have people making life difficult for you because of your dreams? Don't worry, God is in control. It is all a setup. Hallelujah. If only Joseph knew at the start that it was a setup. Because the Bible says that he cried and he wailed and asked his brothers to please have mercy and not sell him off. But they eventually sold him off. If he knew at that point in the pit that, he was, he, that it was a setup of God, he would have said, come on, come on, come on. Where are the guys? Where are the Amalekites? Where are they? Come on, sell me off quickly. Because I know that's my journey towards my destiny. Hallelujah. But I think along the way, he must have encountered God. He must have had dealings with God. He must have spoken to God. And God must have ministered to him that this is for your good. This is not for your destruction. This is for your good. I want to prophesy into the life of someone watching tonight. That what you're going through now is not for your destruction. It is for your good in the name of Jesus. It is a setup for your good in Jesus' name. He was sold off as a slave in Egypt. So his brothers betrayed him. Then he got sold as a slave. Yet, he did not curse God or disengage with God because of his challenges or circumstances. Rather, the Bible records that he prospered. How? One, he realized that God was with him. Two, he allowed his realization to shape his attitude and behavior. So it could have gone two ways. He could have said, Lord, you've deserted me. How can I be going through this kind of pain? You have deserted me, Lord. Where are you, God? But he realized that God was with him. And he, he allowed that realization to shape his, his attitude and his behavior. And number three, he became his best, cooperating with God even in a seemingly adverse situation. The Bible says, for God was with him and made everything that Joseph did to prosper. He said he prospered so much that his master, Potiphar, took note that God was with him. His presence in Potiphar's house made Potiphar know who God was. How can an unbeliever know God is with somebody? That means there was something about Joseph.
that reveal the majesty of God, that reveal the excellence of God, that reveal the glory of God. He knew that this guy is a slave with a difference. He knew that luck had shown on him as Joseph entered his house. There were other slaves that had entered, but when Joseph entered, everything turned around. His business prospered. And the Bible says, I got to a point, Potiphar left everything in, in the hands of Joseph. He wasn't even, he, was, he knew Joseph was accountable. He knew Joseph was dependable. He knew Joseph, and this was a slave. While other slaves were moaning, oh, it's too much. How long shall we, you know, when shall we be free? This one went in with a different heart and a different mind. He went into slavery with a determination to prosper. Woof. What kind of mindset is that? That a person will go into adversity with a determination to prosper, even in adversity. <laughs> Understanding that God was with him as he stepped in. Glory to God. I said glory to God. And what does scripture say about him? He did, he, everything in his house prospered. Everything. The Bible says in verse 6, of chapter 39 of Genesis says, And Potiphar left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught that he had, save the bread that he did eat. Woo! Which means Joseph was in charge of his bank account. He didn't even know what was going in or what was coming out. He just knew that profits were coming in. He knew that Joseph would not steal his money. He knew that Joseph would not connive with other slaves to dupe him. Maybe he had slaves that were duping and hiding things, but Joseph came and revealed and unfolded what it means to have integrity. Hallelujah. This, and Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. So Joseph's attitude and behavior in his adverse situation became his training ground for what was to become his future. The circumstance that Satan intended to use to destroy him became what God used to set him up for a lifting. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. See, what Satan is trying to use to destroy you now is what God's using to set you up. If you will cooperate with God. Hallelujah. If you will see with the eyes of the spirit. Because no devil can destroy you because you have God on your side. No demon can destroy you. No devil can destroy you. If it is hard and God is allowing it, it's because it's a training ground and God is setting you up for a lifting. Your life is not in the hands of Satan. Your life is in the hand of God. If you're born again, Satan don't have any hold over your life anymore. So Joseph passed his test on a few grounds. I, I sometimes I imagine if I was Joseph, how would I have behaved? Would I have been, could I have had the kind of mind that Joseph had? There was not one complaint one day from the mouth of Joseph. Not one complaint. Glory to God. Even when his prosperity in Potiphar's house knows died, there was still not one complaint. Oof. His attitude was already shaped. So Joseph passed his test on a few grounds. One, he passed the test of composure, or composure the, the test of trust and faith in adversity. He was composed. He was not moved. Number two, he passed the test of overcoming carnal pleasures. Even when everything looked physically promising, if he had yielded. His fear of God was greater than his love for pleasure. Hallelujah. See, as God's children, our fear of God should be greater than our love for pleasure. If your love for pleasure becomes greater than your fear for God, then you're in trouble. <laughs> Amen? Then you're what? You're in trouble. But his fear for God was greater than his love for pleasure. He passed that test. And he passed the test of unjust further degradation. When he was now cast into the king's prison. But the cue was this. He was cast into the king's prison. Not just any prison. Ah, come on, tell your neighbor right there, say it's a set up. Come on, say, say this, it's a set up. Not any ordinary prison, but the king's prison. In this seemingly much more degraded situation, Joseph was actually much more closer to his lifting than he ever realized. And so for those contemplating giving up, because of perhaps untold hardship at this point in your life, you may actually be closer to your due season for a breakthrough than you ever realize. So now is not the time to give up. 
I needed to stand there out loud and say, now is not the time for me to give up. Now is not my time to give up. I am closer to my breakthrough than when I first started. I know I'm closer. I am closer. I am closer than I even realize. I am closer. That's why Satan wants to throw everything he has at me. Because he knows that I am closer. He knows that I'm at the closest point. Joseph's attitude saw him through the prison. Very soon, the same attitude made him leader over the prison. That the captain of the prison left everything in the... Joseph was now a prisoner. He became a worker in the prison. Hallelujah. And we know that the rest is history. Glory to God. So as I begin to round up this morning, uh, this night laying the foundations, uh, or laying the foundation for, 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 for moving in the power of resilience. So what are the foundations for a life of spiritual resilience? There are some things the Bible does not say, but I believe these were the things that was happening in the life of Joseph as he journeyed with God. You see, when you're going through your tough times, make sure you're journeying with God. Don't, don't be journeying with yourself. Just journey with God. Amen. Make sure you're journeying with God. And in journeying with God, you're journeying in his word. You're journeying in the company of fellow believers. You're journeying. You're not isolating yourself. See, the, thing, the mistake a lot, of, a lot of Christians make is that when they face tough times, they then isolate themselves. Then they don't come to church anymore. Then they don't want to pick up their phones. They don't want to speak to anybody. That makes it worse. Satan just got you where he wants you. Hallelujah. When you isolate yourself, Satan just got you where he wants you. Because what he wants, he wants to cut you off from your source of encouragement. He wants to cut you off from that source that lifts you up. That you come and you're energized in faith. He wants to cut you off. But you're not going to give him the chance. I see you right over the schemes of Satan in this quarter. In the name of Jesus. So what are the foundations for a life of spiritual resilience? First one is full, come to, coming to a place where you're fully persuaded. Full persuasion. Abraham was fully persuaded. Nothing could move him from his conviction. Nothing, nothing. No demon command could, could come over and tell him otherwise. That, oh, you've been trusting God for the past 20 years. Isn't it time to give up? Nothing. The Bible says he was fully persuaded. And I believe that's where Joseph came to. As he journeyed from that place where he was sold over to the Amalekites. And as they journeyed to Egypt, I believe he encountered God. And God said, this is for your lifting, not for your destruction. So calm down, Joseph, and just follow my plan for your life. God is saying to someone right now, calm down and follow my plan for your life. Full persuasion. Because from the place of full persuasion comes unshaken trust and faith. Abraham's encounters with God produced in him the understanding that God cannot fail. If there's anything you're going to hold on to, hold on to this phrase, God cannot fail. So if God cannot fail, I cannot fail. Hallelujah. You hold on to that, say God cannot fail. Sometimes when I'm going through tough times, I imagine, can I ever imagine God fail? If I cannot imagine God fail, then I cannot imagine myself fail. That this, in this situation, I will not fail because God cannot fail. Hallelujah. Abraham came to that understanding that God cannot fail. So number one foundation for a life of spiritual resilience is to be in a place of full persuasion. Number two is to be in a place where there's continuous fellowship in the spirit. It is God's presence that reveals his mind and his agenda for your life. It is not outside of God's presence that you know what God has for you. It is in his presence. So you've got to understand how to be in continuous fellowship in the spirit. You cannot quarrel with God or quarrel with the spirit and hope to have, a, 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 and hope to have progress in going forward. Amen. You cannot be angry at God and expect to have a breakthrough. Nobody is angry at God and then gets their breakthrough. Hallelujah. Continuous fellowship in the spirit. God's presence, mind, and agenda is always revealed in a place of continuous fellowship in the spirit. It helps you to make sense of what's going on in your life because you know where you're headed, understanding that God is with you and working things out in your favor. 
continuous fellowship in the spirit. And lastly, a continuous attitude of gratitude. Hallelujah. A continuous what? Attitude of gratitude. One thing I've realized when I become ungrateful is like the open heavens I enjoy become short. When you're ungrateful, you can't hear God. When you're ungrateful, you can't even sense God around you. But when you are grateful, you feel God all the time. Hallelujah. You know he's right there with you. A continuous attitude of gratitude, no matter the pressure. Joseph was never ungrateful or angry at God for his situation. He never opened his mouth regretfully and asked God why. He was resilient in maintaining a positive attitude throughout his adversity. And I see you continuously maintain an attitude of gratitude. No matter what's going on in your life, you are fully persuaded that God cannot fail. No matter what's going on in your life, that place that you've reserved for fellowship in the spirit, you do not joke with it. Fellowship with the brethren, being present in church, having your personal prayer time, having your personal worship time, being happy to come to the house of the Lord in worship, lifting up holy hands, all those things have their part to play in ensuring that you continuously have fellowship in the spirit. Hallelujah. Making sure that you, you, you're careful about the kind of relationships that you keep around you. Not relationships that move you farther away, but relationships that draw you closer to the living God. And then you continuously present an attitude of gratitude. Let me tell you something. Gratitude does not go by how you feel. Gratitude goes by what you know. Hallelujah. Because you say, I don't feel like praising. No, it's not about feeling like praising. It's about knowing that you ought to praise, even when you don't feel like it. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, it's not about how you feel. It's about what you know. Because the Bible says, when we praise God, the earth yields an increase unto us. It's about what you know about praise. God himself says he loves praise. He says we were created for his pleasure. We were created for his praise. We were created for, for his dominion. Hallelujah. So it is about what you know. So be grateful for what you know about God and how your life should be representing the glory and the goodness of God. And I see you conquer in this last quarter like never before in the name of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. And we honor you tonight because, Lord, even as we go into this theme for this quarter and as we begin this teaching, that we will come to a point where we are not moved by what the enemy tries to throw at us. That we're not moved by the circumstance or situation, but rather we're moved by your word. We're moved by that which we know that you are able or more than able to do. Lord, we thank you. Because as many as are watching right now are beginning to understand that God is with them and the God in them cannot fail. And so, Father, we thank you for the many successes and the breakthroughs and the liftings that are happening in this quarter in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you because you are so good. Lord, we thank you because you are so great. You said there's no temptation that we face. It is as common to every man that you will not so far as to be tempted above that which we are able, but with every temptation you've made a way of escape, which is no temptation would overcome us because we are your children. We overcome every temptation in the name of Jesus. And we overcome Satan and his schemes in the name of Jesus through the power of resilience. And so, Father, we thank you. We thank you for the power and the grace that's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we're able to move forward victoriously over the challenges of life. In the name of Jesus. As Jesus rode and stepped upon the water, riding over storms, that's how we ride over storms. Even in this season and in these times, in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the power of faith that's at work. In everyone right now, all members of Rock Church, those watching from afar, thank you Lord for the power of faith. And we'll believe that the power of faith will definitely deliver our heart's expectations this quarter in Jesus' name. This quarter will end in glory. We'll end in power. We'll end in praise in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We'll give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.